Uh, my name is Hal Curtis, and I am head of marketing at Satsuch, and we are hosting today's webinar on a guide to advanced data processing and AI for satellite missions. Uh, the aim of this webinar series is to really delve into the, the technical topics that are currently um, gaining a lot of interest and attention in the industry and, and speak to the, the experts in those topics, the people with real first-hand knowledge of, um, of the missions, of the technologies, and find out what what these innovations are really about and what, what um, engineers and companies, student teams, um, and anybody anybody else in the industry is interested, what they need to, to think about making decisions for um, the, the, the missions of tomorrow. So we are going to hear from uh, four different uh, experts, uh, four different companies, five, five people, but four different companies. And all of these companies are uh, SatSearch members. And um, we during the during, during the webinar, we will also have the chat function running, during which you can chat to uh, chat to each other or uh, chat to us if you like. But for specific questions, we're not going to run a um, uh, an audio Q and A at the end of the session. We found that sometimes these can take a little bit long, and um, people can't quite get the answers that they need, or people sometimes people can't stay right until the very end, et cetera. So we'll be running a text-based Q&A throughout the session using the Zoom function. So you can find this at the bottom of your screen. You can open the Q&A panel, and then you're able to address questions generally to all of the participants, all, all of the presenters today, or to uh, individuals. And they will do their best to um, answer those throughout, obviously not while they're talking, unless there are some real geniuses here, but um, they will do their best to answer those before the end of the session. And we'll, we'll have a little bit of extra time at the end too. So I think um, without further ado, we can we can start, we can get into the first, um, the first presentation here today. So firstly today, we're gonna hear from Helena Miljevic and Mikhail Gumiela from KP Labs. So um, Helena, if you'd like to, to share your screen, we will... Um, We'll get going on the event, and if you, and again, the audience, if you have any questions, please, please let us know in the Q and A or the chat. Okay, it says that I cannot start screen share while the yes, perfect. Sorry, let me. Uh, okay, I hope you see it now. So first of all, thank you very much for um, for inviting us for organizing this this webinar. I think the topic is really interesting. And we all have something to, uh, to bring to the discussion. So as it was already mentioned, the company name is KP Labs. And uh, today, along with Michal Gumela, who is our system engineer, uh, will show you some examples how the onboard data processing and AI could be used in space. So just to give you um, a short um, introduction about us, why we are here, why we have some expertise uh, in this area. So we are from Poland. Uh, the company was established in 2016 and right now we are almost 60 people. And if you look at our uh, competences, at our products and projects, we could split them into four areas of interest, which is imagery, software, computing and AI. And AI here is the most crucial, most important part. So if it goes to the project summary, uh, just to give you all some, um, some understanding of what we are doing within these five years, we've completed five, uh, sorry, um, eight projects. Right now ongoing, we have uh, 12 more projects. Uh, we are about to start four big projects within the next uh, one to two uh, months. And the, uh, the overall budget for these uh, projects were uh, over 10 uh, million euros. So why we are speaking about onboard data processing and AI in general, why it is so important for space. So first of all, if you look at different predictions and different um, researches, um, one of the example that I found is um, created by Euroconsults that within 2020 and 2029, would, uh, almost uh, 12,000 satellites will be launched where over 1,000 satellites will um, use onboard data processing, which is over uh, 100 satellites a year, which is a huge difference comparing to what we have right now. And according to different, um, uh, different research predictions for 2030, uh, we will successfully mine the moon for water by 2030, or we will operate assets remotely on the moon, 
uh, we will manufacture in the space directly or AI will be commonplace in space. So if you think about areas of interest, area of, of space where it could be used, so it could be Earth observation uh, with, um, you know, increasing the efficiency of uh, satellite images that we use today, according to different numbers, uh, we are using around 15% of all satellite um, imagery data, which means that thanks to the cloud detection or to some bit pixels uh, mitigation or some other techniques, we can increase uh, this number. Another area, it could be risk management that uh, will be beneficial for us as people uh, on the earth. Uh, there is also deep space with this um, delay in the communication and we have to have uh, autonomy and semi-autonomy in, in this area and this is, um, this is must. There is also space debris emissions and uh, there are more and more companies, more and more agencies that are, that are interested in, uh, in space debris and as I say, this is still something where we could also um, use uh, onboard data processing and, uh, and AI. And last but not least is human flights. Not only flights, but also uh, human habitants that are about to happen uh, on Mars or any other uh, planet. So this is um, this is the areas that are uh, quite important for us. And thinking about our products as a company, what we are doing, we have smart mission ecosystem, which is hardware, software, and algorithms combined together where everything works with everything. So we have like Oryx, which is modular onboard software. We have Antelope um, onboard computer. We have Leopard, uh, which is data processing unit to um, uh, process and pre-process data on board of satellite. There is also Le uh, Lion, which is bigger brother of Leopard, um, dedicated to bigger satellites. And of course, there is the Hurt, uh, which are a bunch of different algorithms for Earth observation, but also for uh, telemetry data analysis to check whether everything is working um, correctly with the satellite. And of course, there is Oasis, which is PGSC, and the idea that we want to check beforehand if everything works correctly with the with the satellite. So the idea of this, of this product and, and, and our projects in general is that on one hand, we want to increase mission processing capabilities and mission safety and control on one hand, but on the other hand, we also want to reduce mission development time and mission costs because it is super important in case we're speaking about constellations or mega constellations. So this is where we see a huge potential for onboard data processing and AI. And here where I uh, pass the word to Michal Gumela, who will uh, speak about more uh, technical technical issues. Yeah, thank you, Helena. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, so my part of the presentation will be a little bit different. Uh, I think that you're already convinced about the values behind uh, in-orbit processing. Uh, so I would like to touch the challenges and discuss with you how to tackle them. Uh, so apart from growing interest and uh, clear benefits uh, coming from the edge data processing, uh, when you think about on an orbit processing, you would probably end up with, with a problem of constrained resources in multiple areas. Uh, just to name a few of them, uh, so you, you can think about computational resources, especially for AI that could be limited for many space-grade platforms. Uh, available power and uh, heat rejection capabilities for your satellite platform might be another constraint. Uh, of course, additional mass and volume for uh, additional data processors might be not available um, in your mission, in your budget. So at KP Labs, we designed integrated solution to cover most of the payload needs by a single device. So you can perform data acquisition from your instrument. Uh, you can have a large volume storage, data pre-processing capabilities. Uh, what is, and what is especially important uh, to us, AI processing acceleration, just in a single device that would normally be essential part um, of the satellite essential payload computer. So we propose um, adding such value to, to, to your normal uh, payload computer. Uh, and we propose here a very flexible architecture consisting of uh, radiation hardness supervisor to increase robustness of the mission, 
uh, up to two Zinc Ultra Scales MP cert consisting of ARM CPU and FPGA to cover multiple applications and multiple algorithms and use cases, uh, up to one terabyte of uh, PSLC flash memory, reliable uh, non-flash memory, and plenty of RAM with error, error correcting codes. And of course, a bunch of external interfaces to keep the solution compatible with different instruments, radio, OBCs, so that Leopard, uh, the processing unit I'm talking about, um, can be all you need for payload management with uh, data processing capabilities. Uh, and this is exactly what I would like to present you taking a hyperspectral satellite mission, uh, Intuition 1, um, as the exemplary use case, uh, that apart from the platform satellite bus, uh, consist mainly of just three components. So we've got hyperspectral instruments. Um, in terms of the electronics, this is just an image sensor. Uh, and the central part is Leopard DPU. Mm, and the third component, very important in the onboard data processing, the processing algorithms, both classical and deep learning based. So all of those three components cooperate with one another, allowing us to create an onboard data processing pipeline. So we start with raw frames from the sensor that are transferred to the Leopard DPU as an enormous stream of data, like six gigabits per second. Mm. IP core in the FPJ part of the Leopard is used to receive uh, and store the data. Uh, then we, we may use various pre-processing algorithms, uh, perform co-registration of the data, radiometric processing, and so on, to obtain a hyperspectral cube. After that, uh, a cloud mask is created to filter out useless data to avoid, uh, avoid further processing. Uh, also, at this step, we can store the data for further downlink or compress it or so on. And then uh, clear parts of the imagery uh, of the data are processed in the most important step, uh, the value extraction. So, of course, we don't want to downlink the whole hyperspectral picture. It's really essential when we are talking about hyperspectral pictures. It may be also very essential for uh, synthetic aperture radar data and other multidimensional or uh, quite big data. So we want to make use of our segmentation and classification algorithms to select only the data that is really interesting for us. Mm, so uh, basically we can transform hyperspectral scene um, with multiple bands uh, just to one to the image consisting for instance um, of pixels classified to the uh, classes that we uh, want to find on the picture. So uh, taking this in numbers, it means that we can squeeze our typical uh, 50 by 50 kilometers scene from 1,500 megabytes to just four megabytes of data. Uh, of course, we need to first train the algorithm. So this is uh, quite important and uh, quite big uh, challenge uh, for in-orbit data processing. We need to train the data for particular use case uh, of course, we can um, use the neural network architecture multiple times and the architectures can be reused for multiple problems. Uh, so, th of course, the typical use cases cover agriculture, including disease detection, um, surface type classification, um, and even soil parameters mapping uh, that we are working currently uh, on and fine tuning our algorithms to, um, to demonstrate it in the practice. But as I said before, when we are thinking about on-orbit data processing, we always keep in mind the resources. So the questions may uh, arose, uh, is efficient AI inference on embedded systems suitable for space application? Uh, is that possible? So we prove uh, in our research, uh, re recent research uh, paper that, that that's true. So benchmarking deep learning for onboard space applications uh, tackles various image processing problems to cover multiple use cases. 
uh, three state-of-the-art uh, deep learning models for air surface segmentation for object detections, uh, namely in that case, a crater detections on moon surface. Uh, and the last one for uh, Mars surface classification. Uh, we've proven that performance of over two tera operations per second is achievable uh, just on the single processing node of the LEO part, and you can have two. Uh, for our most computing intensive model, we got uh, 20 frames per second of the AI inference. Um, and testing different power profiles of the inference, um, we show that you can choose lower power dissipation uh, or you, you can choose higher peak performance depending on the budgets of your missions, technical budgets that you have. And what is really nice about uh, this, uh, we did all the work on the Leopard DPU uh, eval board model. So the model designed for algorithms, prototyping and testing on the ground uh, compatible with the flight model of the low part. Uh, as I said, we are um, treating the testing um, on the ground very seriously before uh, you will deploy um, the algorithm in space. So this is also our solution for, for that challenge, how to test uh, the things uh, on the ground. But going back again to our challenges, uh, all that algorithms that I've just shown you normally cannot work without great data. I mean data on the proper level of processing. So when you apply the algorithms uh, on the data available on ground, typically use, for instance, level two data or so. But to have the same on board, it's essential to perform all the steps on orbit. Uh, so you would require radiometric corrections, atmospherical corrections, georeference, and so on. But the case is even more complex when the pre-processing requires that the data that are hardly available on board, like state of the atmosphere uh, to, to perform the, the, the corrections. Um, so once again, uh, here we decided to use deep learning um, techniques to solve the issue. Um, our approach was to train our AI models um, with different uh, atmospherical conditions to automatically compensate for the effects. Um, and actually we succeeded in that experiment. Uh, so I will share with you our results uh, in, in the paper. Uh, I really encourage you uh, to read and to, to apply uh, in your mission that approach. So uh, in this brief presentation, uh, I think that uh, I showed you that even there are a lot of challenges, um, we believe that more missions could benefit from the on-orbit processing, uh, will be able to tackle um, and will be able to tackle those challenges together. So thank you for uh, the attention. Great, thank you very much, uh, uh, Helena and Michael. That was a uh, that was really interesting. Thank you. I just wanted to remind everybody that um, if you have any questions on that presentation, or for the the rest of the panelists in general, please feel free to use the Q and A function in the in the, the bottom of the Zoom panel. And um, next we have uh, Zoltan from Lombic Technologies. So Zoltan, if you're uh, ready to share your screen, please. Yep. Hi everyone. So. Uh... Indeed, I'm Zoltan Lewoski from Lombic Technologies, and why I'm glad that I'm here is because while we are not really a space industry uh, player yet, we just entered uh, or just have ambitions to get into the space industry um, if I'm, I'm not too uh, uh, far-reaching. But I think we can provide a unique perspective from a software development stand standpoint. We are a software development company working on modern high-level applications and our Hesslier tool can probably uh, provide something useful for uh, onboard data processing in such a way too. Uh, because day-to-day um, -day we are actually doing web development mostly uh, with open source Microsoft technologies. Um, there's, a, there's an open source web content management system called Orchard, where we are worldwide market leaders. And we work with companies like Microsoft itself, Live Nation, or the Smithsonian Institution. But um, 
we have a couple of uh, R&D projects and one of them is Hathlier. But before actually talking about it, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, what we see is relevant here on, uh, um, on onboard processing in the new space sector. Uh, well, um, there are FPGAs. So, um, of course, um, FPGAs are, um, are proven when it comes to uh, their power efficiency and uh, performance advantages, and they are widely available. Uh, particularly, uh, I would focus here on the Zinc family of devices. So, um, I'm sure uh, most people here are aware that a lot of uh, new space companies, KP uh, Labs included, of course, have uh, some kind of onboard computer or payload computer that are built around Zinx, which couple an ARM CPU with an FPGA. Uh, however, um, FPGA development today, and that's um, also true for uh, also true um, for um, uh, for ground-based processing, uh, still requires uh, requires specialist knowledge. I would say. So um, there are pre-baked accelerated libraries, uh, there are high level tools, but still, if you want FPGA acceleration, you need to actually understand and be able to use FPGAs. Also, uh, when it comes to space specifically, um, there are many SDKs. Uh, every satellite or, or OBC manufacturer pretty much has their own SDKs. Uh, what's more, these SDKs are usually uh, secrets. Uh, hidden, uh, you have to purchase the, the device and or the SDK to, to be able to look at it at least. Now, compare this to how app development works uh, otherwise. So on the desktop, in the web, for, for a smartphone, you have all kinds of SDKs, mostly open source, readily available. You, you get all kinds of resources, development tools for free. This is not really what's currently in the space sector. Uh, but probably uh, we can provide some kind of solution with the .NET platform and with our Hathlier tool. Now, uh, .NET, if you are not that familiar with it, is a, is a software development platform, which is cross-platform, runs everywhere, including Zinx. It's open source, uh, both the SDK and the runtime, because it's a, it has a runtime because it's a managed environment. Uh, there's um, a garbage collection and all kinds of things that make executing your application safe. So the most thing that you can do is crash your app, uh, but that's also quite hard and it's easy to recover, but you can't crash the operating system. And since it's a modern platform, uh, development is easy. Uh, you can just do app development uh, as usual and you get all the modern tooling. You get modern... Um, IDEs, debugging, uh, automatic checks like static code analysis, automatic testing, and, and everything that's in app development currently. And with Hesslier, you can also get automatic hardware acceleration with FPGAs. So you needn't, uh, needn't drop the performance requirement. Because of what Hesslier is, is a tool that takes a computer program and turns it into a piece of FPGA logic. So not just any computer program, uh, of course, .NET, but .NET is a platform. It's not a programming language. Actually, a lot of programming languages are, are supported. So uh, C Sharp is the most popular one, but also C++, for example, or functional languages like F Sharp, or even scripting languages like Python or PHP JavaScript. Now, um, Imagine uh, writing your, your, your uh, synthetic aperture rad radar data processing code in PHP. Of course, uh, uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Uh, so you might have uh, um, got the gist of it that we are talking about in technical terms, FPGA high-level synthesis that is very, very much focused on software developers and for software developers. You don't need to understand FPGAs. You just write code pretty much as usual, but you still get FPGA acceleration. So uh, all in all, um, what we intend to do, or what we already have actually, is that if your algorithm is uh, highly parallelized and compute bound, you get a performance increase. 
Um, you also get a higher power efficiency, so the benefits of FPGAs, but it's still software development as usual with .NET, with all the modern tools. I would add though that this is not meant for mission critical systems, especially since it's a managed environment. It's, um, it's not determined, the runtime, the execution time is not deterministic, well, of the software part, the FPG implementation is of course. So a uh, lot of talk, now let's actually switch over to a hands-on demo. And what I'm showing you now is a bit of code. I hope nobody uh, is afraid of that. Uh, what we see here is an example of, of an algorithm that would be suitable for FPG acceleration with Hasslier. As you also see, it's called parallel algorithm. Now, spoiler alert, it's a massively parallelized, it's an embarrassingly parallel algorithm. It's kind of an exaggerated example. It, it doesn't do anything too uh, useful. It's just, uh, it's just a, a, a synthetic example. Um, it has some logic here, uh, which pretty much simulates that we are computing stuff. Um, and it does this in tasks. Uh, by tasks, um, I mean .NET tasks, you can think of them a bit like threads. Uh, the point here is that we will open or start this many tasks, 280 tasks. And the 280 tasks will run as 280 threads on a CPU. Well, not at the same time because the .NET framework will, will make sure that there's no uh, starvation of resources, but still you get those two, four, or how many cores. Now on the FPGA though, uh, you will get a hard level, hardware level parallelism of 280. So we generate 280 copies of the inside of your algorithm. And this is all standard.net. Uh, so I opened Visual Studio, which is a standard development environment for .NET developers. Uh, this is standard C sharp. There are pieces of the of Hasslier API, but the language is the same. Um, everything happens from code. You can debug it as code. It's just .NET as usual, except that you can automatically uh, turn this into a piece of hardware with Hasslier. And let's actually see how that works. Because I also have a, a development port uh, prepared here. Uh, this is a Trans Electro, uh, Trans Electro development board. Here in the middle, we have a, a Zinc development board, uh, daughter board that's uh, built around the uh, Zinc 730. And now I uh, opened a remote shell to it because it runs Petal Linux, of course, and I will run our demo. Uh, what happens now is that first, that parallel algorithm that I showed you is executed as software. So you will see how uh, the whole thing uh, uh, performs uh, as simple software. Now, this Zinc has a, two, a dual core uh, ARM CPU clocked around 650 megahertz. So that's what we get on the CPU side. And on the FPGA, we have the 730's uh, FPGA clocked at around 150 megahertz. So uh, the whole thing happened. Let's check out the results. Now, uh, as we see, the software execution was uh, around uh, 25, mil uh, 25 seconds. So we do a lot of stuff, that's all right. Now let's uh, check out the hardware execution time, which is down here. And altogether, it was 320, 300, around 330 milliseconds. So the hardware execution is about 100 times faster than the software execution, which is not a big surprise because we pretty much got a 280 core processor just for our application. Now, of course, FPGAs have limits. So this is a simple algorithm. It will, it will be able to have that many copies, but uh, even for more complex ones, you can get uh, parallelism in the order of dozens, which is still a lot more than what you get with the two cores on the ARM. Uh, by the way, if you are interested what's behind the scenes, Hesler generates VHDL. So this is a piece of VHDL that Hesler writes. Um, you, can, you, you can check out Hesler. Uh, it's up on GitHub. I will share the link to it. 
Uh, you can also check out the VHDL code it generates. You can inspect how it works, but it's well, it's uh, it's commented code, and it, as you can see, it's uh, also formatted. It's still generated code, so it's not that easy to inspect. But uh, you should be able to get the gist of it if you are interested. All right, um, so um, that's probably cool. But is there anything else? Uh, well, yeah, uh, we actually support uh, the Vitis environment of Xilinx. Um, what this means is that Hessler supports every Xilinx FPG with Vitis support, uh, with the Vitis uh, SDK support, uh, which includes not just uh, all the Zinc boards, but also the Alveo cards, for example, the high performance uh, accelerator cards found in uh, data centers. So that means that if you are using Hessler, uh, well, you can write code for onboard processing in, in the high-level, safe, convenient environment of .NET that will run on board of a satellite or a drone or, or of a robot. And you can run the same thing on, uh, on a high-performance accelerator card on, uh, in the in-ground segment as well, in the cloud or on-premise. The same code. But of course, uh, when running in the clouds, you will have a much bigger FPGA, probably 50 times bigger. And, and those FPGAs uh, that we support are available in, in every major cloud. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea of the results, uh, apart from that single sample I showed you, and these are again uh, sample algorithms that we have, again, up on GitHub. Uh, the benchmarks are also up on GitHub and their details. Um, with the Alveo cards, the in-ground segments, we get something between four times and 34 times P decrease. Uh, and then looking at the power efficiency increase, that's between 20 and 120. Which a power efficiency increase is nice, of course, but uh, where this matters most is that this, uh, this uh, corresponds to cost savings. On Zinx, uh, we have actually nicer uh, results. The, the speed increase is between 24 and 120 uh, times. The power efficiency increase is uh, also 20 something and 150 times, depending on the, the algorithms. Um, we want to have more use cases um, and in orbit demonstration as well. Uh, that's the next step that we are planning. If you have use cases, please let us know. Uh, I would be glad to, to talk about it. Uh, we are also in a, par in a partnership with the Wiener Research Center for Physics, uh, which allows us to uh, test some scientific computations. And FPGAs are nowadays in every major data center, so it's a, it's a versatile technology to invest into. So uh, pretty much that was it from me. Uh, if you are interested, please check out uh, the SDK on GitHub. The source I've shown you and all the other examples and the results and everything is up there. And be ready because I think that we'll see a lot more about FPGAs, both in ground segments and both for onboard processing. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Zoltan. That was that was uh, really interesting. It's great to have great to have a demo of the technology as well. There's not many pieces of space hardware that we can have a, a live demo of with a, on a webinar. So um, that was that was great. Thank you. Um, Okay, so next we uh, will be hearing from uh, Matthias Person of Unibap. And um, just to uh, mention again, guys, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. So um, Matthias, thank you. All right, thank you very much. And um, I'd like to also acknowledge my colleague here, Søren Pedersen, and I think also will be around here during the Q&A session, maybe supporting uh, any questions that you might have. And uh, I'm re representing Unibap, and Unibap is bringing uh, cloud technology uh, up on orbit to the satellite and extending the possibility of uh, executing containerized applications on orbit uh, on your satellite. Uh, we are a dedicated, uh, uh, I would say, payload data processing uh, technology. Uh, we don't replace any onboard computers, etc., but could give input to control of, of things. But uh, it's purely to bring in sensor data, uh, do um, 
uh, cloud-based computing using containerized applications, using Docker containers and the RPC calls, and um, handle the data on orbit as well as uh, queuing up and download data for to the ground segment. Uh, so what we allow then would be to have data preparation and meta tagging on orbit using uh, AI and machine learning. And we can also create uh, a spectra of very low latency data products. Uh, the solution itself is an x86 based heterogeneous architecture. So it's a lot of heritage software that actually can be deployed on orbit to support your missions. And um, uh, this is a kind of a uh, schematic to show uh, the different aspects of uh, cloud-based computing in, uh, in space, uh, where we, uh, for instance, may have a, a satellite uh, using a space cloud. Uh, you find something of interest uh, in the image uh, or in the data stream uh, captured by sensors on board. Could be optical sensors, could be RF-based sensors or, or whatever. Uh, and then uh, that data either could just be prepared and, and sort of filter out anything of non-relevance. And then you queue up the data to be downloaded, uh, omitting all the data that would be, let's say, fully clouded uh, coverage, uh, um, MTC or whatever, that would be of no relevance. Uh, or uh, you could actually get a very, let's say, low latency data product already uh, manufactured or, or produced on, on the satellite using a processing pipeline. And that information could be forwarded using intersatellite communication, for instance, or, or just queued up as um, high prioritized uh, download to the next uh, satellite pass uh, and be readily available for the end user. Another scenario we also uh, heard earlier about would be uh, introducing autonomous uh, operation and autonomous mission uh, or parts of the mission, I would say. One way would be to autonomous task the next uh, satellite in line, for instance, of something, uh, an event uh, of interest, to sort of uh, provide a tipping and queuing capability where satellites could um, continuously um, detect and monitor uh, something of interest without the need of doing processing on ground beforehand and then reschedule satellites uh, after a certain amount of hours to, to sort of uh, take care of that uh, in next passes, etc. And this would be, of course, very much more important if you talk about a uh, lunar mission or, or mission on Mars or, or uh, wherever it's going to be very low latency in the communication between an operator and the satellite. Uh, the other aspect of this would be the increasing amount of uh, spatial and, and uh, spectral resolution on sensors, for instance. I mean, it's a huge amount of data that they can produce with high, high frequency. And in order to download all that raw data and, and do the processing on ground, uh, if you have a larger constellation of satellites, it suddenly become a very uh, cumbersome task. Uh, of course, the ground station uh, providers would be very happy about that because it would be requiring a lot of communication. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we think a lot of, a lot of things could be handled on satellite uh, with a smart way of distributing your or segment your uh, compute tasks. You could. Uh, actually find yourself in a situation where you have a much lower cost for your mission and or you have uh, data products at a very much lower latency to your end users. Uh, so what we provide there to pro uh, enable this would be the space flight uh, uh, on uh, computers um, and the associated ground equipment for development and an operating system and framework SDK for the developers and then we have a number of different application partners and, and the growing ecosystem of different applications where already uh, pre, uh, let's say pre-tested, pre-configured uh, applications could be used in the processing pipeline on orbit uh, to provide uh, different compute tasks. We'll talk more about that. Uh, the software stack is essentially a Linux, uh, a Linux uh, distribution that is uh, uh, based on Ubuntu. It's a frozen one uh, where we have some uh, tweaks to the kernel and, and some specifics to the drivers that, we, uh, that, that enable uh, this to work uh, seamlessly on our uh, implied hardware. On top of that, we have the Space Cloud Framework uh, that allows you uh, to have these um, uh, cloud computing uh, capabilities to execute 
code and applications in containers uh, on the satellite, and then uh, a number of different applications or libraries of different applications. And here we really think this is a key enabler for future developers to actually come from uh, traditional uh, software development on ground for terrestrial applications, uh, could be image processing programs or, or, or other types of applications that you would like to port to the space platform. And, and that could fairly straightforward, uh, easily be done here using this uh, framework. Uh, this is an example where we are uh, right now flying on uh, the, the orbit of uh, David uh, Ion Wild Drive mission. And uh, just as an example, we within four months from start, from actually where we signed, uh, we're, we're in agreement of what to do, uh, delivery of hardware to the satellite and, and performing integration of uh, up to 23 different applications that, that has been running on, on, on the satellite. Uh, we, we have been sort of showing and demonstrating that it's really possible to, uh, to have a very rapid deployment of software, uh, quite advanced software on, on board the satellite. And um, just to uh, showcase the uh, small form factor of uh, half a U uh, sized um, computer is called X, uh, IX5100 in this case. And uh, we are also in development of uh, next generation of uh, onboard processing unit, having more than 20 times more capability up to 50 times more capable than the, the existing one. Uh, so that is in process. So this is an example where we have um, actually ported the full um, uh, full software suite of uh, Envy. Uh, Envy IDL has been sort of put into the space cloud as a um, uh, application, uh, meaning that the full software suite is there and one could write a small application of five to 10 megabytes of size upload and orchestrate that to perform on orb processing of images captured by, by the sensor. And um, Envy is having a quite, uh, quite a long heritage of, um, as a software on, uh, for terrestrial computing. Um, uh, this is an example of what we did and uh, it's a 100 square kilometer satellite um, multispectral image uh, from Worldview 3. This was canned data. Uh, we did not have the sensor uh, on board on this uh, mission. Obviously not the sensor capable of uh, uh, 30 centimeters of resolution. But uh, this image, uh, the task was to find the uh, in-flight, uh, mid-flight airplane in this image and uh, running algorithms to, to, to find, find that uh, needle in the haystack as it, was call, as it was called the challenge. And together with Saronia Sat, one of our partners, they developed the algorithms for detecting airplanes in mid, mid air flight. And um, uh, this is uh, what can be achieved within 10 seconds uh, on an X5100. Just to give you an example, what can be, what can be achieved on orbit. And uh, I think uh, with that, I would uh, kind of uh, stop uh, my presentation here and now and maybe have a few discussion points later on and, and um, uh, happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Matthias. That was, uh, that was brilliant. Oh, sorry, I've got a little bit of an echo. Um, yeah, thank you. There were a couple of questions asked in the chat function uh, for you there, Matthias. So maybe you could have a, have a quick look or Soren. Um, so, yeah, really interested. And then finally, we have uh, Edwin Fair of uh, Xiphos. So, Edwin, if you're ready, you could. Uh... Very much. Um, everyone sees my screen. Yes, everything's good. So, um, so my name is Edward Fair. I'm the president and um, director of business development for um, Zyphos. I'll first give a little background on um, on uh, Zyphos and our products. Uh, this is going to bring the level in, in terms of the level of granularity right down to the the actual um, processing boards and some of the low level functions that you can do because that's what Zyphos does. So. Um, we've been we've been doing this since 1996. I call us the the grandfathers of new space. Um, the the idea was to use uh, terrestrial computing products um, and uh, network communication and bring them up into harsh environments. Of course, it's difficult to get uh, a little much harsher than space. So effectively, what we do is we use um, industrial grade 
com, um, products, uh, com components in a fault tolerant architecture. And uh, we use them, uh, our architecture allows you to use these in a space environment, uh, obviously at a much smaller fraction of the cost of a, of a space grade solution. So our, our, our products are basically processor boards and um, FPGAs have, have been given a lot of uh, press in this last hour and I'll do the same. So our products are based on multiprocessor system on a chip FPGAs and they're generic computing modules that would be used um, in a subsystem, <clears throat> target applications, target markets, obviously satellites and increasingly unmanned vehicles and science experiments on the moon. So I'll just briefly go over just a few of the key products and then just to provide context to the rest of the slide in terms of data processing. But um, one of our products is the uh, Q7. So it is based on a uh, Zinc uh, 7020 FPGA. So this is uh, similar to what was mentioned by Sultan. This is a dual core ARM uh, processor. <clears throat> we have some other supervisory functions on board, et cetera, to make this a space uh, product. It's got um, you know everything you need to, make, to have a processor, but we also leverage uh, the FPGAs. Effectively, this is a very small board, about a business card size board weighing about 24 grams. And um, effectively, what we do is we take most of the I.O. from that Zinc FPGA and we bring it out to a what's called a mezzanine connector on the bottom side of the board. <clears throat> so they could, they could be used with an application-specific daughter board that is typically customized to the application. Another product that we have, this is based on the, the Ultra Scale Plus, which was also mentioned in this, um, in this uh, webinar. Um, so the, the Ultra Scale Plus, the reason why it's so interesting is that it's got effectively seven processors on board. It's got four application processors, two real-time processors, and a GPU. And it has about five times the, the um, FPGA logic uh, as the Q7. So this is probably you know, for very, very, you know, higher compute requirements. Uh, this is an, an excellent product and uh, it's, it's seen its way into Earth observation systems, uh, SAR systems, uh, software-defined radio systems, and so on. Uh, a, a close variant of the Q8 is the QHA. This is similar to the Q8, except we brought out some additional <clears throat> gigabit per second interfaces, uh, mostly for software-defined radio applications. Now, a typical project or a subsystem would include the processor, which you see on the left, and that would be installed on a, on a daughter board, which would have the specific I.O the specific connectors, form factor, functionality that would be required for a mission. Every mission is different. Uh, some missions might require mass memory on board, like a solid state drive or, or so on, and uh, different interfaces, different connector types for all applications so that the daughter boards are typically custom. But it leverages the, the IO and the FPGA space and the CPU that are built into the process reports. So to do a little deep dive, you know, everyone talked about FPGAs and, and so on. So why, what makes them so interesting and so um, useful for, for advanced data processing? So on the left, you have the Zinc 7020. On the right, you have the Ultra Scale Plus. Effectively, what's important here is the fact that you have the embedded processor cores, two in the case of, of the, like I said, the, the Zinc, and up to seven, well, four, real, uh, four application processors in the Ultra Scale Plus, and where you would typically run your operating system like Linux and so on, um, as well as all the you know, standard peripherals that you would require to build a CPU around your, your FPGA. And then the important part, of course, is the programmable logic with built-in memory and with all the, 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 the logic gates and, and flip-flops and so on that, that are part of the subsystem. And of course, these, these subsystems also have embedded hard cores for communications, for you know, gigabit Ethernet uh, interfaces, USB can, and so on. So that that functionality can also be brought out into the subsystem. So I mean, it's been touched on, but just to, to kind of repeat it. Um, so you know, why do you need um, why do you need the advanced data processing? So 
today, you, you know, we need increasingly complex algorithms. Oh, sorry, increasingly complex algorithms on, um, on on smaller platforms requiring low power, low space, and uh, with constrained power, of course. So today, we have very high resolution sensors. We have software. I'm, I'm fighting PowerPoint. Excuse me. Uh, high resolution sensors and so on. So the the ability to take that data and feed it to a processor. Um, you have to do some pre-processing and that's where the FPGA uh, comes in. So not only do you have to interface to that FPGA, to the, to the sensors, but you have to be able to um, pre-process the data so that it can be handled by the CPU itself. Um, and modern sensors today generate gigabits per second of data. So it's impossible for um, processors to keep up. So you need that, uh, that logic. Another application is software defined radios um, where you're not talking about data processing per se, but you are are, you are actually processing very high speed digitized RF, you know, in gigabits per second. So you need that, um, that uh, FPGA front end to do the pre-processing. So some examples of, of where um, this is used. Um, so like I said, interfacing with the, the sensors, typically in a earth observation, for example, type application, <laughs> it looks like my, uh, my Process my presentation as a mind of its own. Um, so there's, there's various, um, uh, various, various uh, interfaces to the cameras. Uh, these would include a camera link, space wire, LVDS, or gigabit per second transceivers. Um, th then. Uh, you need real-time processing that has to be performed in the in the logic of the um, of the FPGA before the data is processed is pro is provided to the uh, CPU. So this allows us to use a standard non-real-time Linux OS combined with a real-time front end that's happening in the FPGA uh, in order to um, in order to do this real-time application. So some some examples of of of, of um, pre-processing that we have done or data processing we have done. Um, <sighs> Sorry. Is um, so first at, at the very front end, you have to you have to correct uh, the imager. So that, that that'll include some uh, gain and offset adjustment, maybe some lens distortion and correction of the image itself from the camera. Um, you might have bad pixels, and you don't want those bad pixels because you're going to be doing processing on the data. You want you don't want those bad pixels to infiltrate your data and um, and uh, reduce the quality of the data. So you have to correct for those. Uh, binning is a very common uh, function where you're effectively reducing the data sets by fact factors of four or eight, uh, reducing eight pixels into one to, to um, it reduces the resolution, but allows you to uh, process in real time. Uh, Co-adding is a function where you'll, you'll uh, add multiple function, multiple images together to reduce the signal to noise. Um, the same with, uh, with TDI. Uh, centroiding, we've done, for example, you have a, an image that you're looking, you're looking for the, the center point of the image. Uh, we've done applications where we've been able to centroid at 30,000 frames per second using uh, the logic. Uh, feature detection, a very important thing for, um, for um, rovers and so on. And of course, compression. And for software-defined radios, uh, we have the all of the... Um, uh, the, the building, the DSP building blocks that are required to interface to the the, uh, the, the RF transceivers at the front end, the ADCs and DACs. So I just want to talk a little bit about hybridization. So hybridization, um, it leverages the, the tight coupling of um, processors and logic in the in in an, an FPGA in an MPSOC FPGA. So it allows you. Um, so, so logic itself it excels in computing things in high volumes, like it was described by Zoltan, um, where you have a lot of similar calculations all going on at the same time. CPUs, of course, are, are good at other things. So when you, hybridization um, allows you to take a cue card and exploit those on an, on an FPGA. So we've developed a, a methodology um, where we take conventional C code, we're able to uh, profile that C code and, and see where the processor is actually spending a lot of its time. And then identifying those pieces that, that, um, um, that 
are amenable to be ported to uh, to um, to an FPGA, and then we will implement that in VHDL. Then uh, that VHDL code is is um, is the, the software is updated to access the VHDL code as opposed to the, the the software library or the software function, and then you end up with an accelerated um, application. So, as an example, <clears throat> um, so the top part of the chart shows what what CPUs are good for. They do they do one one they do one app one operation at a time. Um, so so for example, if you have three operations after the fourth cycle, you'll have your output. Whereas in the CP, you know, in the FPGA, you can load that pipeline with data every single clock cycle. So instead of having one result after the pipeline is filled, instead of having one result every four clock cycles, you'll have a result every 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 clock cycle. So that's just an example of pipelining and how it's it's it, it can be improved in an, in an FPGA. Now. If, if that works well, then what works even better is if you then expand that. And then, so now you're able to process um, multiple data streams at the same time. And, and that is the advantage of hybridization. So what we've done is we've, we've taken various algorithms uh, that, um, for example, the Canadian Space Agency, our agency in Canada, um, had particular interest in a variety of, uh, of particular algorithms. And what we did is we hybridized those algorithms and we compared it to their operation on the, the typical development environment, which is, you know, you develop your algorithms on a PC, uh, running, um, you know, on an i7 PC, and uh, you test out your algorithm. But then the problem is, okay, how do you get that running in a, on a space processor that's running at two watts as opposed to my hundred watt um, uh, Intel i7? So <clears throat> we've hybridized these as examples, these various uh, algorithms, and you can see um, their performance. So. Um, if you look at the first column, that shows the performance versus a an i7 running at 3.46 gigahertz, run, running multiple hundreds of watts, uh, versus running on a two watt um, Q7. So, which is obviously very applicable for uh, either satellite or, or uh, rover applications. So you can see that in general, I mean, it depends on the application, depends on the sorry, on the on the uh, algorithm itself. Some are more amenable to um, to the, the advantages of hybridization than others. But you can see that in general, performance can either meet the real time performance can either be met with a two watt processor, or we, in some cases even multiple multi multiples. And of course, the the big um, the big savings is on power. So if you look at the, the third column, um, that would show you the, the power savings uh, and, and um, that went running on a two-watt processor versus like the i7. And effectively, it, it makes the difference between a mission being able to, to, um, to happen or, or not. Uh, to give another example, this is, this is a product that we have, um, well, a, a system we've developed called Evo. Um, so it, it uses uh, hybridization of various algorithms. Um, so it performs what's called uh, visual odometry. So you're on the moon, there's obviously no GPS. Uh, you have to be able to know where you're going <laughs> and keep track of where you're going. So that's what embedded visual, that's what visual odometry is. So it acts as a sensor that um, gets connected to the rest of the, um, the GNC of the, of the, um, of the uh, rover to do uh, to do localization uh, to 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 tell the rover where it is. So what you see on the on the right, so on the so it's basically a stereo camera which is connected to a Q7 through a board called uh, a camera board, and um, we ran it through its paces. The Canadian Space Agency ran through its paces, and what you see in that uh, graph. Um, you see a chart of the ground truth, which is basically a GPS uh, measurement of, of localization through a specific route. And what you see in green is the results from Evo. So, so what you have here, like something typically, again, which would run on a laptop that's, that's sitting on top of the rover in the case of a terrestrial application, now is able to run in real time. Uh, this was actually operating at 11 hertz. 
um, uh, able to operate in real time uh, to be able to help the localization. We also did some other interesting uh, things with this with Evo. So that little that little video you see on the bottom right is actually our hazard detection and avoidance uh, algorithms that are running. So because we're using stereo, we're able to localize if there's a hazard, and it's put into the GNC to actually stop the rover before it does itself some harm. And it was tested with various types of obstacles. And we've also done, uh, it runs an algorithm as well to do disparity map, mapping in 3D point clouds. So you can actually get a 3D point cloud when, um, when for example, when the rover's at rest, uh, you can get a 3D point cloud to, um, to be able to plan the science. Now, the whole idea for, for EVO is to get better localization and to support um, more autonomy because the more autonomy a rover has, um, the more science the scientists can do. Uh, so the, as you can see, um, the, the average error was about 1%. And again, this is on the, the Q, this was used in the Q7. The performance would even be better on the Q8. And, the, and we did testing with the rover um, at six kilometers an hour, even though we actually tested up to, uh, to 10 and 15 kilometers an hour. Now, there's not going to be too many rovers taking a joyride on the moon. So, you know, six kilometers an hour is certainly uh, much more than uh, needed. Now, just to touch on other elements, um, there's been a lot of talk about AI. Now, we're not an AI company, so um, uh, well, but what we want to do is enable our customers to uh, use AI in their platform. Uh, so we've ported uh, uh, Vitus AI, which was mentioned by Zoltan, uh, to the, the Q8. Uh, so Vitus AI supports, you know, various um, frameworks like TensorFlow and Cafe and, and so on. And it provides the, uh, the, the, um, the, the unified software platform, uh, provides the various elements that are required uh, to, develop, to develop an AI uh, application and get it running um, on a, the, for example, the Ultra Scale Plus. Uh, what's, what's interesting uh, about the about Vitus, it, it uses something called a, a DPU, which is a deep learning processing unit. Uh, effectively, these DPUs are instantiated into the logic, and they act as a as an artificial intelligence coprocessor uh, to the to the the, pro, the um, application processors in the Ultra Scale Plus. Um, so the the compiled data, they, this DPU has shared access to the the DRAM on the board, along with the host CPU, and then together, and um, so. The, this coprocessor uh, will run uh, the compiled code that is generated by the Vitus toolset um, uh, within the DPU. So again, it acts as a, an AI um, coprocessor. Um, I, just as a, as an example, because again, we're not we're not the um, we don't we don't develop our own AI applications. But we have a, a company. Uh, one of our partner companies out in Ottawa, but a couple of hours away from us. And they're developing some very interesting uh, algorithms using AI. And, he, and this is running um, either on the Q7 or the Q8. So here's just an example. Uh, so effectively what they're doing is they're doing terrain classification. So in real time, the ability to use, um, generally could be the navigation cameras, could be a hyperspectral camera, whatever type of cameras on board the rover to identify and classify um, terrain. So you, what you see on the, for example, if you look on the bottom, the, the picture on the left is the image from the, um, from the uh, cameras. But what you see on the right is a real time overlay um, that, that it used AI to identify the terrain. And uh, so for example, whether it's regolith, whether it's a crater, the interior of a crater exterior, and it's color coded for um, the ease for the operator. And the intent here, just like I guess Evo, um, is to accelerate the science. Another thing that, is, uh, that it, it performs is something called novelty detection. So, you know, you expect regolith, you expect a crater, you expect a boulder, but you, you may not accept, expect, you know, a small meteorite that's in, in the frame. So the novelty detector will provide that information to the scientists. Um, and so, again, to, to, you know, quickly, more quickly decide on uh, the science that they want to do. Um, Anyway, so um, they use various various um, various networks, uh, various algorithms for for this, which are indicated here. Um, so th they're going to be running this. Uh, this is actually going to be flying uh, on a mission um, shortly, the Emirati's uh, lunar mission on their 
over on a Q7. So again, on a two watt processor. Uh, and as well, they're doing work uh, with our Q8 processor in Iceland right now and um, in their own indoor, moon, they have their own moonscape in their office building, which is always fun. Um, and uh, for the Q8. Now for them, uh, Vitus AI wasn't enough because they wanted it to be a, a little more um, hardware and, and platform and uh, system and processor agnostic. Uh, so they developed their own tool chain um, for this um, to make it a little more gener generic to based on this based on this uh, the NNEF um, format. Um, I, I'm not certainly not an expert at this, but you know please if, if you're interested in any information either about help about getting AI algorithms implemented on a space platform, a low power space platform, you know please reach out to mission control. I have uh, Mikhail's um, uh, contacts at the bottom of the screen, uh, either for uh, if you need support with AI algorithms or uh, to access their tool chain. So just in conclusion, um, besides I, realizing that I, I, I lost the battle against PowerPoint, um, in conclusion, so hybrid processing, um, the, the uh, the hybrid processing that's capable that you can do in, a, in an FPGA in a multiprocessor system FPGA can be leveraged to perform advanced data processing. So in the case of the Q7, it's the Zinc 7020. In the case of the Q8, it's the Ultra Scale Plus. Um, generally, the real time processing is is performed in the logic um, before the data is provided to the CPU. So that allows you to use standard non-real-time operating systems that eases development the eases development and your development costs. Um, you could use tools like hybridization to uh, to to actually get very complex algorithms running uh, in real time uh, on the processor. And again, inference inference can be done very quickly and cheaply uh, on an FPGA. Um, so to get AI applications running, so whether it be through Vitus AI, through custom tool chains from third parties. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. I apologize for my battle with uh, with PowerPoints, but thank you for your time, everybody. Great. Thank you very much, Edwin. That was um, that was really really interesting to see uh, lots of the results there and lots of those examples. So um, really appreciate that. And so, yeah, thank you to you and to all of our presenters. Um, that was that was our final talk today. I'm just going to share my own screen. That, yeah, that was our last presentation today. But as I've mentioned, you know, throughout the Q&A text function is active. It's been running throughout. So um, before, if you have any final questions or any, any general questions you'd like answered, please, uh, please feel free to ask uh, our presenters today. Um, and just to give some time for people to ask questions uh, uh, based on, you know, Edwin's uh, presentation there and for the rest of the presentations. Um, I'm just going to uh, discuss a little bit, summarize some of the key points from the session today. And then talk a little bit about uh, our work at, at SatSearch and, and some, some things we have coming. So firstly, today we heard from Helena and Mikhail from uh, KP Labs, and they discussed that the, the reasons why we could have so many satellites per year with um, onboard AI, the uses, uh, the, the requirements for that. They talked about the applications of the technology, deep space missions, Earth observation, human spaceflight, etc. Um, the challenges that, that, that the systems face based, you know, constrained resources, the certain amount of volume, power, et cetera, that's required. And um, the processing pipeline, an example of the processing pipeline. So I was really interested to see how the stages that the systems must go through in order to actually provide useful, valuable data. So that was really interested and it was um, good to see uh, KP Labs' uh, own portfolio there as well. Next, we heard from Zoltan of Lombic Technologies, who uh, discussed the challenge of onboard data processing from, from a software development perspective. He talked about the benefits of FPGAs and, and the contrast really between uh, space software development and, and web app development, um, and also gave us a really good live demo of, of Haslayer, demonstrating the value of this form of, of hardware acceleration and, and what the system can achieve. So um, that was great, as well as touching on a bunch of, uh, of other technical aspects there. So. And then we heard from uh, Matthias, person from Unibap, who discussed um, the company's space cloud uh, ecosystem, the cloud-based computing and data processing in space, including uh, applications like meta tagging and autonomous tasking and uh, intelligent ground ground tasking as well. So. Um, yeah, it was really interesting to learn more about the space cloud ecosystem and the software stack, how the different parts work together. And he also showed us some really interesting examples of data, the um, 
geolocating the aircraft uh, mid-flight was uh, really interesting. I know that was managed on on um, CAN data, but as as as, is, as has been discussed, it's a case of radiation hardening testing, getting these things flying, and um, we'll have applications that can be um, accessed on a much shorter much shorter time scale than using CAN data. So that was brilliant. Finally, we had Edwin and Zyphos, one of the self-proclaimed grandfathers of new space. Um, who discussed with us some of the uh, the technical specifications of, of the company's processing hardware, the use of FPGAs for you know effective pre-processing and, and in other parts of uh, parts of the data processing chain. The FPGAs, as you will have realised, came up many times through throughout the talk today. So um, really interesting to learn more about the technology. Uh, Edwin also discussed how logic is leveraged um, in order to process high-speed data and and uh, Algorithm, hybridize, algorithm hybridization, uh, where computation is shared between CPUs and pro programmable logic and what benefits this brings as well to applications. And then he gave us some examples of those applications as well, with the, um, particularly with um, the use of data using AI processes, um, particularly the rover, rover navigation and, and research that can be carried out on rovers. So um, that was fantastic. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed hearing about um, all of these different applications and areas. The, remember, we'll get versions of the different presentations, the slide decks available for you. And we'll also provide the video recording of this session. So please look out for that in a follow-up email. Um, and just before you just before you go, I wanted to share with you details of our next webinar. So um, some of the applications today touched on Earth observation. In fact, quite a few of them, some of the applications discussed. Uh, but of course, the um, Earth observation, a core technology in that, that whole set of applications are the cameras. So the topic of our next webinar, which is on the 15th of December, is going to be um, a guide to selecting Earth observation cameras for satellite missions. Um, as I say, 15th of December 2021 at uh, three o'clock Central European time. And um, with all the different you know, options on the market today and the complexities of using different subsystems, aperture sizes, satellite form factors, it, it can be quite a tricky task, possibly an increasingly tricky task to select the right uh, payload for a mission. So again, we'll be hearing from experts, uh, Berlin, well, they, they're all listed there, Berlin Space Technologies, Dragonfly Aerospace, Red Wire, Satlantis, um, Sat Revolution, and Simirosense. So um, if, you, uh, if you'd like to uh, join us for that webinar as well in December, you can uh, register at the link that um, should be provided there in Zoom. Yeah, fantastic. And um, yeah, we would we would love to see you all again. And of course, in the meantime, the the SatSearch webinar series is just one aspect of our work. You know, kind of trying to open up and develop the space industry as much as we can. So here's a few other quick notes on how uh, how SatSearch works and how you can get involved in the marketplace for space. Firstly, if you are a space industry supplier yourself or you represent one, and you'd be interested in listing your own products and services please do take a look at the membership information and, and the process, the application process there uh, to discuss how we, we might be able to help you access the, the global industry. Secondly, and um, possibly more likely for, for the audience here is if you are an engineer, researcher or potential buyer in the space industry, then you can find out more about the technologies that were discussed today and about thousands of other products, services, companies from all around the world on our platform at satsearch.com. The platform includes a free request system that you can use to request technical details, uh, documentation, company introductions, quotes, or information on lead time, or anything else you might need for trade studies and procurement purposes. And finally, just to stay up to date with uh, our work, the, the content we put out, and the, the marketing that we that we carry out, there are there are multiple different ways to get in touch with us like any company online today but just to focus on three quickly we have a podcast called the space industry where you can hear in-depth discussions on uh, space technologies and first-hand experiences from companies across the world and actually several of today's presenters have spoken on on that podcast over over the last um 12 months or so since we've launched it so um that would be great if you could you can find that on at the link in in the chat or on any good streaming platform of course um, then there's our weekly newsletter. We share trending stories from around the space industry and insights from our own members and our work too. So that's just a, a free email sign up there. And um, finally, as well as social media, there is our Slack channel, 
where which is open and um, you can register for that and interact with the sat search community and discuss anything about the space industry that you like we, we're uh, quite a friendly bunch there so um yeah we would love to see you there as well if you like or